Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste Today we begin the second module which is basics of silviculture. In this module we will be having three lectures, what is silviculture, plant growth factors and ecological succession. So, let us begin with what is silviculture. The word silviculture comes from these word roots, silva meaning wood or forest or tree because we are getting wood out of trees and cultura is cultivation. So, essentially silviculture is wood cultivation or this art and science of cultivating forest crops. So, when we talk about silviculture what we are trying to say is that we want to have a forest that is managed in such a manner that we are able to extract or cultivate wood out of it. Now, this field of silviculture is intimately related with another field which goes by the name of silvics. Now, silvics is the study of life history or general features of forest crops with respect to environmental factors as basis for the practice of silviculture. So, what, what is it saying? It says that silvics is the study of life history of forest crops. So, when we say life history the, the question is if we look at any particular species of tree or if we are looking at any stand, how does this stand develop? So, uh, for instance in the case of uh, any tree it will start say as a seed and then it will grow into a seedling and then it will become a small plant and then it will grow and after a while it will uh, become aged and then it will die. So, this life history how much time is this, uh, is this uh, tree going to remain as a seed, how, how long uh, will its life expectancy be? These are the things that go in the field of the life history of the forest crop. General features looks at things uh, such as uh, how do you identify uh, these species in a forest or say how much is the amount of light that this plant requires. So, for instance in the case of plants we can have two different kinds. So, we can have light demanders. and we can have the shade tolerance. Now, light demander as the uh, word indicates is a species that requires quite a, a lot amount of light. So, for instance if you have a forest, if you have a tree and say if you grow a light demander at this location where you are getting ample amount of shade of the mother plant. So, in that case this light demander will or may die out. Whereas, in the case of the shade tolerance they are able to tolerate shade. So, they are able to grow in this location as well. So, silvix is the study of life history or general feature of forest crops with respect to environmental factors. So, the next level of complexity is the environmental factors. So, if we have a forest uh, stand, if we are looking at a forest, what is the impact of environment on this forest is also something that we study in silvex. So, for instance, if you have uh, uh, a stand of cheer pine plants. So, cheer pine is a species that grows in uh, mountainous areas or in cold areas. Now, if there is an environmental change. So, for instance, we are having uh, global warming these days. So, if the temperature of uh, this location goes up what will be the impact on the forest stand is also something that we are going to study in silvex. So, we are looking at the life history or general features of forest crops with respect to the environmental factors as a basis for the practice of silviculture. So, why are we interested in knowing all of these? We are interested in knowing all of these because we want to make certain decisions. So, for instance when uh, you are having global warming when temperature is going up at a particular location and suppose you are planning to have a forest that has to be created 
and you are going to extract wood out of it say after 90 years or say 100 years. So, in this period of 100 years, if we are expecting that the temperature is going to increase in this period, what are the species that we should plant in that area. Or for instance, if there, uh, if, if because of your climate change, there is um, an increase in the extreme factors such as droughts. So, should you go for the indigenous plants or should you go for some drought resistant varieties of these plants is also something that we are interested in knowing. But we can only make these sorts of decisions when we actually know what is the impact of drought on each and every of these species. So, what we are trying to say is that you have species 1, species 2, species 3, species 4 and so on. Now, the first species is able to, tro uh, to tolerate drought and the second species is also able to tolerate drought, but you are having a situation in which uh, the first species if there is an increase in temperature it is going to die out, but the second species is able to tolerate changes in temperature as well. And then probably you have a third species that is able to tolerate say uh, uh, insects. So, there is a, an impact of insects and you are having the situation. Now, when you know all these factors that what, uh, what is the impact of these different factors on different species, then only you can make a decision. So, for instance, if you have a location in which in the period of 90 years, we are going to have a say an 80 percent probability of a drought, probably a 70 percent probability of an insect infestation but say only a 10 percent probability that you are going to have an increase in temperature. So, which of these species should you go for? If you say went for this is species, species 2. So, there is a good chance of a drought, it will be able to tolerate that. There is a good chance of an insect infestation, but then your species 2 will not be able to tolerate that. The species 3 if you have a situation of drought it will die out. In the case of species 4 you have drought and it dies out, but in the case of species 1 it is able to tolerate drought, it is able to tolerate insects, it is unable to tolerate changes in temperature, but then because you have a very low probability that there is going to be an increase in temperature at this particular location you can go for this species. So, to make these uh, managerial decisions you need to know the characteristics of each and every of these species and the characteristics of different forests both in the native conditions and in the changed conditions. So, silviculture is the study of life history or general features of forest crops with respect to environmental factors as basis for the practice of silviculture. So, what is silviculture then? Silviculture is applied silvics. So, you are, you are doing an application of all this knowledge that you have gathered in the field of silvics to grow your plants. So, that is applied silviculture is uh, applied silvics is silviculture. Now, in the case of silvics we need to understand the impacts of all of these different components of forest on the characteristics of the forest. Now, forest happen to be biological communities. So, they will be having abiotic components as well as biotic components. Now, abiotic component includes soil, water, air, sunshine and so on. So, abiotic is non living. So, non living components includes things such as your soil, water, air, sunshine and so on. Now, what is the impact of all of these? So, let us say consider the impact of water. So, you have certain species in your forest and these species are able to grow at a presence of water that let us say on a unit of 0 to 10 you are having a level of 5 and these species are able to grow in this forest. What will happen if this 5 becomes say 3 or it becomes 7? So, if you have a condition in which the amount of water is less, you will probably be having a drought like situation. 
so what is the impact of a drought on these species or if you are having an excess of water you probably have a situation of water logging or a situation of flooding so what is the impact of an increase in water on these species or these individuals is something that we also study in silvex so we study the impacts of the abiotic components as well as the impacts of biotic components now biotic components includes trees shrubs vines grasses insects birds reptiles and mammals so do you think that all of these will be having an impact on a forest so let us see look at the impact of grasses so you have a forest in which you have seeds and these seeds are now developing into seedlings but in this location we also have tall grasses so now the amount of sunlight that is available for your seedling is controlled by the amount of grass so the uh, the length of the grass or the height of the grass and also the density of the grass that is impact of sunlight that is seedlings now if your seedling is shade tolerant in the uh, then it probably will be able to uh, to tolerate a much greater amount of grasses as compared to if it were light demanding similarly if your seedling has a characteristic that is that it is able to better uh, extract out water and nutrients from the soil as compared to the grasses it will be able to outcompete the grasses but in certain situations you can have a a situation in which the grasses outcompete your seedlings in which case your seedlings will die out similarly if you look at the impact of another biotic component say insects so there are a number of insects that feed on seeds so in that situation you will have your seeds that are here on your trees and the insects eat them out or these seeds have fallen on the ground and then the insects devour on them so this will have an impact on the forest so both the abiotic as well as the biotic components are integral parts of the forest but they also regulate the forest and they are also important when we look at silvex or silviculture the next concept is that of the layers of a forest so if you look at any forest we'll see probably four layers so here is your soil then you'll be having certain species that form a thick canopy now canopy refers to the uppermost branches of trees in a forest that form a more or less continuous layer of foliage so canopy is something that you can think of as an umbrella so in this forest these plants are making a continuous layer on top so this is a continuous layer so this is the canopy and these trees will form the canopy layer so this is the canopy layer that is growing in your forest but then you'll also have certain species or certain individuals that are of a height that is less than the height of your canopy trees so probably you'll have a plant that grows at this height now these plants typically will be shade tolerant whereas your canopy was a light demander so your shade tolerant plants that are growing below your canopy layer form the understory so in this understory you have a condition in which the amount of light is much less than what was available to the canopy plants because these plants are growing in a shade like situation at the same time the amount of wind pressure on these plants will be less because they are surrounded by these canopy plants also the amount of moisture that is typically present in this understory layer 
is much greater than what is present in the canopy layer. Because in the case of the canopy you have the sun that is leading to some amount of desiccation, it is leading to eva uh, it is leading to transpiration from your canopy plants. But then these plants in the understory layer they have a much greater amount of uh, uh, they have a situation in which a, a, a much greater amount of moisture is present in the surroundings. So, typically the amount of transpiration in this uh, layer is much lesser. Then you can also have some plants that grow above your canopy layer. So, there can be certain individuals that above the canopy. So, these go by the name of emergent layer. So, these are the plants that have a height that is greater than the canopy and these individuals will have a much greater amount of wind pressure to tolerate. They will also uh, have much greater amounts of desiccation that they should be able to tolerate, if they have to emerge out of these canopies. Then the fourth layer goes by the name of the forest floor. Now, forest floor typically will be having grasses, it will also have the leaf litter that is falling from all of these plants, whether the canopy plants or the emergent layer or the understory plant. So, it will also be having a huge amount of dead uh, leaves or the fallen leaves, it will also be having some twigs or some branches that have fallen down and this layer which goes by the name of the forest floor. Uh, now, what are the kinds of, situ of uh, situations that this layer plants should be able to tolerate? One, they will be having very less amount of light, because any light that is left out of the emergent layer and the canopy layer and the understory layer is the light that is coming to these grasses. So, the amount of light is very less, the amount of carbon that is there in the soil or the amount of humus that is there in the soil is very huge because all the leaves and the, uh, the dead twigs are falling into this layer and they are decomposing. The amount of uh, small animals or insects or microorganisms that these uh, plants should be able to tolerate will be very high. So, these are the four layers of the forest. So, you have the canopy layer, you have the emergent layer, you have the understory layer and you have the forest floor that is typically comprised of grasses and herbs. Now, why do we need to un understand all of this in the case of silviculture? Now, this is because when we go with silviculture, we will be having certain management objectives. Now, suppose your management objective is that you want to extract the maximum amount of wood from this forest. Now, if you want to extract the maximum amount of wood and you are and you want uh, it to be in a situation that you are able to extract it out in the most economical manner or in the most simplistic of manners, you will you will probably want to go with a forest that only has one uh, species of trees. So, for instance you will want to have a situation in which all your plants are teak plants. So, in that case you will have to, to construct a, a situation in which your emergent layer is gone your understory is gone and probably even you can uh, let some grasses remain or you you'll, you'll want to have a situation in which even your grasses are gone. Now, if you know the characteristics of all these different layers, you will be able to, to uh, tinker or modulate your forest to meet your silvicultural goals. Now, what can be the other silvicultural goals? Why do we do silviculture? We do silviculture to, to achieve certain desired outcomes such as quality timber production. Now, if your aim is to go for a quality timber production, you will probably want to go with monoculture, you will not want to have a situation in which you have a, high, a huge amount of biodiversity or different layers in your forest, you will only want to have a situation in which all your plants belong to the same species, probably also of the same age. So, that uh, the uh, all your plants are having uh, typically the same height and the same girth. So, that will be uh, that can be one silvicultural objective. Another objective could be say production of species of economic value. Now, if we look at this forest, 
probably you have different uh, species that um, that have different market values. Now, for instance, you can have a situation in which these grasses probably they are medicinal grasses and they have a huge market value, they have a huge market potential. So, in that case your silviculture will comprise of a situation in which you will want to get rid of all these trees and create a situation in which your grasses can grow in a profuse manner. Or say for instance, you have a situation in which you have some teak trees and say mango trees. Now, uh, the timber uh, value or the uh, the economic value of uh, of the timber from teak is much greater than the economic value or the cost of uh, the timber from mango. So, you will want to have a situation in which you replace your mango trees and move towards the teak trees. So, that can be another silvicultural objective. A similar silvicultural objective could be to increase your production or the volume of timber per unit area per unit time. Now, this could be uh, say because of your economic considerations or this could be as a way of mitigating your climate change. Now, in the case of uh, climate change, you are having more amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and you want to create a situation in which the trees that are growing in your forest are able to sequester or absorb all of this carbon dioxide, convert it into biomass and store it in their bodies. So, if you have this kind of an objective to enhance your carbon stocks in the fastest possible time. So, that can also be one of your silvicultural objectives and that would require a very different kind of management as compared to say a, a silvicultural management for maximum economic production. So, for instance you can have a situation in which you have teak trees which typically say take 90 years to uh, to form uh, say 100 100 tons of uh, carbon in their bodies but probably you have say mango trees which say take 50 years to form 100 tons of carbon in their body now, if your aim is to go for say uh, carbon sequestration, you will want to have mango trees in preference to your teak trees. So, what you want will depend on what is your, uh, your silvicultural objective. Now, another objective could be reduction of rotation age or average age at which a tree is considered mature for felling. So, in this case what we are saying is that typically your teak trees are currently taking 90 years to reach the maturity. Can you do something to reduce it from 90 years to say 70 years? Probably by say uh, putting more nutrients in the soil or going for better varieties of teak. So, that you are able to reduce the rotation age or the maturity age. So, that can also be one of your uh, silvicultural objectives. Now, in that case you will be managing your forest in a way that the faster growing trees are retained in this forest and the slower growing trees are removed from this forest. So, that after a while you have individuals that grow faster and in that case their progeny will also be individuals that have these characteristics of growing faster. So, in that case you will be able to convert your rotation age from 90 years to 70 years. Another silvicultural objective could be raising of new forest in blank areas. So, for instance, if you have a situation of a mine, so there was this land which was then mined out. So, there was mining that was done in this area. Now, after you have extracted out your minerals or the ores, you have a situation in which you have this situation. Now, this area is a blank area. So, it does not have any vegetation whatsoever. So, you can have a silvicultural objective to fill this area again with certain type of soil and then regrow your forest on top of this mined area. 
So, that could be one of your silvicultural objectives and in that case the kind of management that you will do will be very different from the other kinds of management. Another silvicultural objective would be uh, or could be the creation of wildlife habitat. So, probably you are doing silviculture not to extract wood, but to have the largest uh, numbers of wildlife in your area. Now, wildlife will require a very different kind of situation than your timber production area. So, for instance, you can have uh, this forest in which you have grasses. So, you uh, you will have uh, some grazing animals that are able to use these grasses. You will have canopy layer in which uh, there could be some birds that uh, that make their nest in the canopy layer. You, you will even want to retain your understory, because probably your understory is providing certain fruits to the wildlife. You will even want to retain the emergent layer, because there could be certain species that only uh, uh, reside in very tall plants. So, if your silvicultural objective is to manage your forest for wildlife, you will go for a very different kind of treatment to the forest. Similarly, your uh, one of your aims could be doing it for aesthetics. So, in the case of aesthetics, you you will uh, uh, you will uh, you will do certain treatments such that your forest looks beautiful. So, a beautiful forest in certain situations it could be uh, going towards monoculture, so that all your trees look of the same size and the same height or in certain other situations you would want to go if your if your aesthetic viewpoint is to have a mixed sort of a forest you can probably go for a mixed sort of a plantation. So, that can also be one of your silvicultural objectives or you can have an objective of introduction of a foreign species or, or an exotic plant such as eucalyptus. So, when eucalyptus was introduced in the Nilgiris that was a silvicultural objective or you, you uh, or one of your objectives could be protection and maintenance of a site for intangible returns. Now, what are intangible returns? These are the, the returns that you cannot see or feel with your senses with your senses. So, intangible return could be say uh, things like uh, like uh, purity of air in your area or reduced amount of pollution or reduced amount of noise in your area. So, you can have a situation in which you are doing silviculture, so that you are able to protect or maintain a site for the intangible returns. So, for instance, uh, when we talk about planting of trees along the road sides, that could be one of your silvicultural objectives. So, next let us have a look at a short history of silviculture. So, how does how did this discipline come into being? So, if we look at the impact of humans on environment of forest, we have this equation that is i is equal to p into a into t. So, the amount of impact that humans will have on a forest i goes uh, i refers to the impact is dependent on the population pressure. So, more the number of people more is the impact of those people on the forest. A is the affluence or the per capita need for resources. So, if you have a society in which one person requires say 10 kgs of firewood and you have another society in which one person requires 100 kgs of firewood. probably because in the first situation they were only using it to cook food, but in this situation they are using it to cook food to keep their houses warm probably also for the lighting of the nearby areas. So, in this situation we will say that the amount of affluence of this society is greater than the amount of affluence of the previous society. Now, more is the amount of affluence or the per capita need for resources, more will be the impact of this society on the nearby forests. Now, T refers to technology or the ability to extract resources. 
Now, probably in this situation, you have a society that requires all of these resources, but here you are only able to extract. So, you require 10 kgs of firewood, but you are only able to extract 9 kgs. And in this, in the second society, you have a lot more affluence, but even though they require 100 kgs of firewood, they are only able to extract say 50 kgs. So, this is another factor that will govern the amount of impact of your society on the forest. So, now let us look at it in numerical terms. So, you had 10,000 people, each of them requiring 10 kgs of firewood, but the technological efficiency was only 90 percent or was 90 percent. Now, in this second society probably you have 50 persons each of them requiring 100 kgs of firewood and the efficiency of extraction or the technological efficiency is here 50 percent. So, the impact of the first society is 10,000 into 10 into 90 percent. The impact of the second society is only 50 persons into 100 kgs into 50 by 100. So, in this case you have 90,000 kgs of wood extraction and in this case you have 2500 kgs. So, even though the second society has a much larger requirement of firewood per capita, the total impact is lesser. So, I is equal to P into A into T. Now, if you look at primitive societies, so if you look through history, earlier you had aboriginal societies. So, people were hunters, gatherers uh, and the population was very small. The requirement of wood or resources was also very small, because in those days we did not have computers, we did not have large scale extraction of minerals, we did not have uh, very good agriculture, we did not require uh, or uh, we did not have access to fertilizers or pesticides. So, the amount of resources that one person needed was very small. The population size was also very small, because uh, it was the beginning of the civilization and the technological ability to extract the resources was also very small, because we did not have access to the modern science and technology. So, what was the impact of this society? So, small population, small affluence, small technology. So, there was a little impact on the forest and the forests were in plenty. So, in those stages there was no need for any silviculture. So, there was little need to conserve the forest, though in certain societies certain food or fruit or fodder trees may be conserved as religious trees. So, in those days people started worshipping those trees that were of utility to them. So, the only amount of silviculture was that if you have a fruit tree that was there in your vicinity, you protect that tree, you do not cut that, that tree for firewood, but, uh, but other than that there was hardly any need for large scale intervention. Then with time there was modernization. With modernization the population increased, the affluence increased. So, with modernization you now require more amount of resources per capita. The technology also increased to extract these resources. So, the amount of impact of, um, uh, of a modernizing society is much greater than the amount of impact of a primitive society. So, with the growing impact on the forest due to unabated exploitation, forests started, get, started getting scarcer. So, now people started feeling that there was a pinch of resources or a pinch of forest resources. But in these times, though there was an increasing need to conserve forest, people could go with an expansion of their empires. So, for instance, you had this much amount of for, uh, uh, in your land, you had these many forests, but because of affluence and more use of resources, your forests are getting now scarce. So, now you have only this much amount of forest that is left, but what you can do is that you can expand your territory 
and in that case you can have access to the other forests that are available. So, this was the second stage of the development of silviculture. So, even though people started feeling that there is a dearth of resources, the forests are getting scarcer, the amount of conservation in increased a bit, but not to a very large extent, because the needs were met by expansion of the empires. For example, the expanding of uh, Roman empire or the British empire, but then after a while we reached the third stage of the societal development. So, the population has now increased, the affluence is large, the amount of technology is large, the amount of impact on the forest is also very large, but now you do not have any more areas that are left for, uh, for in increasing your expansion or the exploitation of the forest. So, now you are having a situation in which the impact is very large, but you do not have newer areas in which you can go and extract the resources. So, now there is a pinch period in which you do not have any other option than to manage your forest in a scientific manner, so that you are able to increase your productivity. So, now in this stage the forest conservation becomes imminent and the scientific management of forest gets born as a discipline to meet the needs of the society. So, if you consider say the British empire in the beginning they had very less number of people, there was hardly any impact. Then when the society started uh, to become more modernized, they started expanding their empire, they reached India and they started exploiting the forests of India. So, uh, when uh, in those days for instance, uh, the ships were made out of wood. So, there was a very large scale extraction of wood that was done in India and all of that timber was then moved to uh, the uh, to Britain. But then after a while your uh, exploitation has grown to such an extent that now no more uh, trees are left in India. What do you do then or very less number of trees are left in India. So, then the Britishers started thinking okay, what we can do is to increase the number of trees that are there in the forest. How do we do that? They started to think okay, should I cut a, a tree when it is say 10 years of age in which it has reached its height, but the girth is very small or should I wait for say 20 more years. So, that the thickness of this tree also increases, when is a good time to cut this tree, when is a good time to plant a tree, what are the resources that are required by a tree to grow. So, when you start thinking about all of these different factors, then you are uh, moving towards a scientific discipline of silviculture. So, most of the world from the mid 19th century is in this stage. Now, these stages or these stages of development of silviculture can also happen as in a cyclical manner, because societies go uh, uh, move from uh, an ebb to a tide. So, for instance, if you look at the Mauryan civilization, the Mauryan empire, they had strict codes for conservation, but then I, uh, after a while when we had the British period, they moved towards the expansion period and the forest were cut indiscriminately. So, <coughs> you can also have a situation in which an earlier society is putting much more emphasis on conservation than a later society. So, these things can also move in a cyclical manner. So, that was the short history of silviculture. Now, how do you do silviculture? So, silviculture is done through silvicultural practices that are uh, made into silvicultural systems. So, what is a silvicultural practice? Silvicultural practice consists of various treatments that may be applied to forest stands to maintain or and enhance their utility for any purpose. So, a practice is a treatment that you are giving to a forest stand. What can be a treatment? A treat can a treatment may mean say cutting of trees or say cutting of uh, the climbers that are growing on a tree. So, all of these things are silvicultural practices. Another practice could be to go with an artificial regeneration of forest. You go into a forest and you plant start planting trees. So, all of these things are silvicultural practices, they are treatments that are applied to forest stands. Now, why are you applying these treatments? 
to maintain these forest stands, to maintain the utility or to enhance the utility for any purpose. Now, what are these purposes? These purposes are the silvicultural objectives that we looked at before. So, your uh, objective could be to extract more amount of timber, your, your objective can be to, uh, to have biodiversity in that area, your objective could be to maintain it for aesthetic re uh, reasons. But given those objectives, what are the treatments that you are applying to this forest to, uh, to maintain its utility or to enhance its utility goes by the term of silvicultural practice. And a set of practices forms a silvicultural system. So, a silvicultural system is a planned program of treatments during the whole life of a forest designed to achieve specific stand structural objectives. So, you have these treatments, but then when do you give these treatments? So, for instance, one treatment is to plant trees. So, when should you plant a tree? You have a forest and you are going to cut this forest for a period of say 90 years. So, in a period of 90 years, your, uh, your plant moves from a seed stage to a maturity stage. Now, in the case of a forest, suppose you have this piece of land, should you say go with uh, seeding in all of this area or planting in all of these areas and then you wait for 90 years and then you cut these forests. Is that what you want to go for or for instance, you have this forest and you divide it into four sections, you are going to plant this section in the. Uh, so, you have these four sections and or let, let us divide it into nine sections. So, for the first 10 years, you are going to plant this section, then you are going to leave this area, then you cut another section and then you plant this area, then you cut here. So, earlier you had trees everywhere and now you, what you are doing is you are cutting trees in one ninth of the forest and then planting seeds. Then you cut trees in this one ninth of our forest and then you plant the seeds. So, that when you reach from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So, when you reach at this stage, so you have cut this forest and you have planted the trees, you have a situation in which the forest of the first section have now reached to a maturity stage. So, if you go with this kind of a system, probably you will be having uh, work at every point of time. In this section uh, or in this system, you had a situation in which you planted the whole of the area and then you had nothing more to, to do in the next 90 years and at the end of 90 years, you again have a huge amount of work to do to cut these trees and to plant it again. In this system, you have divided your work in a temporal fashion. So, the silvicultural system is a set of all of these different management options that you have. So, the silvicultural system is a planned program. So, you are doing a planning of when to apply which silvicultural practice. So, it is a planned program of, treat, uh, of treatments during the whole life of a forest designed to achieve specific stand structural objectives. Now, what can these objectives be? They can be to achieve a certain age class structure. Now, what do we mean by a, an age class structure? So, if you look at a forest, if we have and this is the number of plants. Now, typically the number of seeds or the number of saplings that are from the age of 0 to 1 will be very large. So, you have a large number of small plants. Now, in the middle stage you probably have less number of plants and in the end stage you have a very less number of plants, because at every stage you are going to have certain amount of mortality. So, for instance, you started with 10,000 plants. So, you have 10,000 small plants, but then these plants are also getting eaten up by insects or probably by mammals, the herbivores, they are eating up these plants. So, at the end of one year, you say 
are only left with 1000 plants. At the end of the second year, now your plants have become a bit taller and they are now no more the preferred species. So, at the end of uh, the second year, out of these 1000 plants, probably you have lost only 200 plants and 800 plants remain. Now, as these plants are now increasing in their uh, in their ages, the amount of uh, resistance that they can give to an organism that is trying to eat this plant or is trying to attack this plant will go on increasing. But still you will be having certain diseases that these plants are subject to. So, at the end of say 5 years in place of 800 plants only 600 plants remain. Now, you will so in this situation you have a case in which the number of plants was very large to begin with then it drops and drops and drops and after a while you have a very small number of plants that remain and the number of plants becomes constant, but then you also are having some certain amount of mortality because the age is increasing. So, you have plants that are of an older age and they are dying out uh, because of the age factor. So, you have this sort of a curve. So, this is a certain age class structure that is present in a natural forest. But now, if you want to manage this forest, if you want to cut timber or extract timber out of this forest, you would want to have a situation in which probably uh, for a, a certain section of the forest, all your trees are of the same size, the same height and the same diameter. So, in that case you want to shift from this sort of a section to a forest in which you have these many trees that are from say 0 to 10 years of age, the same number of trees that are from 10 to 20, the same number of trees that are from 20 to 30, the same number of trees that are from 30 to 40 and so on. So, this can be your uh, stand structural objective to achieve a certain age class structure that may be a natural age class structure or a modified age class structure or your stand structural objective could be to change the site occupancy and the preferred species mixture. To give an example, you started with a natural forest in which you have say 20 different kinds of species of trees, but only 2 of those 20 species are of an of a commercial value. So, you want to change your forest, so that in place of 20 species you have only 2 species or you have only 1 species in which we case in which case we call it a monoculture. So, that can be your stand structural objective to change the preferred species mixture to change the site occupancy of these trees or you want to have a, a stand structural objective to change the spatial distribution of trees from clumpy to uniform or vice versa. So, in the first case you have a situation in which you, so this is your forest and these are the trees. So, you have trees here, you have a group of trees here, you have a group of trees here and in the other areas there is a very small number of trees. So, you have a clumpy distribution of trees. You probably want to change this into a situation in which your trees are uniformly distributed in the whole forest. So, this can be another of your stand structural objectives. So, you would want to convert it into a uniform distribution if you are trying to extract it for timber. Whereas, if you want to manage this forest for wildlife probably you would want to move towards this forest, because in this case you will have certain species that live in these clumps, there are certain species that live, live in these grasslands, which have less number of trees. So, again changing of this spatial, uh, spatial distribution of trees can be your one of your stand structural objectives or another objective could be the creation or maintenance of desirable spatial, uh, uh, special structural attributes such as trees for wildlife or snack trees. So, in this case what you are saying 
is that your objective is to have certain special trees such as a snag tree. Now, what is a snag tree? A snag tree is a tree that is that probably is of a large height, but more importantly it is probably a dead tree. So, in this tree you have hardly any leaves that are here, but then you have certain hollows that have formed in the timber. Now, these hollows can be used as nesting sites for certain species. So, your specific your uh, stand structural objective could be to create these trees with these special attributes or to maintain these trees with these special attributes. So, that can be another of your stand structural objectives. So, your silvicultural system is a planned program of treatments during the whole life of a forest designed to achieve specific stand structural objectives. Now, when you are trying to achieve these objectives, you will also have to look at certain other branches of forestry. So, they are intimately linked with silviculture. One such field is forest protection or the branch of forestry that concerns with the activities of prevention and control of damage to the forest. This damage may be due to man, animals, fire, insects, diseases etcetera. So, what we are saying here is that you are trying to maintain this forest for timber extraction. So, you wanted to have this forest, but then your forest had a forest fire and all of these trees got burnt. So, that is not a desirable situation. So, in that case apart from having this special uh, this uh, spatial distribution you will probably want to have certain fire lines. So, these are the sections in which you are not growing any plant. So, you are leaving these uh, portions of soil denuded. So, that your fire is not able to jump from this section to this section. Now, when you are when you are uh, incorporating this uh, feature into your forest even though it was not a part of your uh, uh, your uh, stand objective you are doing this because you want to protect your forest. So, forest protection and the concepts of forest protection will be intimately linked to silviculture. Another field that is intimately linked is forest mensuration, mensuration is measurement. So, forest mensuration is the art and science of providing the quantitative information about trees and forest stands necessary for forest management, planning and research. This information may be about dimensions, example diameter, height, volume of trees or stand, form, age, increment etcetera. So, we will we are going to look at these points when we uh, look at the module on forest mensuration, but what this is saying essentially is that if you are unable to measure your forest you will not be able to uh, 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 to manage them what cannot be measured cannot be managed. So, for instance you want to manage your forest to have the maximum amount of carbon sequestration, but if you do not know what is the amount of carbon that is sequestered in your forest how are you going to manage it. So, forest mensuration is an integral part of silviculture. Another is forest utilization or the harvesting disposal and use of the forest produce you are trying to harvest the forest produce, you want to dispose it off in a market, you want to use it for certain purpose. If you do not know how your forest or timber is going to be utilized, you will not be able to manage it properly. So, for instance, you want to have a forest and in this case probably you are going you are trying to extract your timber using large size machines. Now, if you want to use these large size machines you will have to incorporate into your silvicultural system something that permits your large size machine to enter into this area and something that protects the small seedlings or the saplings from the uh, impacts of these large size machines. So, if you do not know how your forest is going to be utilized you will not be able to manage it for your uh, silvicultural objectives. 
Another branch is forest economics or the branch of forestry dealing with forests as productive assets subject to economic principles. So, your uh, silvicultural objective was to have the largest amount of money that you are able to earn from these forests. But if you do not know how to value these forests, how to do a, a cost computation of, of uh, your uh, uh, inputs and the outputs, how are you, uh, how will you, uh, you select a system that is able to provide you with the maximum economic returns. So, forest economics is also a branch of forestry that is intimately linked with silviculture. Also forest management or the practical application of the scientific, technical and economic principles of forestry. So, you wanted to, um, to manage your forest for say carbon sequestration, for that you want to plant certain species, you want to plant them at certain periods of time. So, there is no way in which you can overlook things such as human resources. So, you will have to uh, recruit certain people, you will have to train those people, you will have to provide them with certain resources. So, this portion that technically goes with the field of management is also something that you will have to uh, study and implement if you want to objectives. So, all of these branches are intimately linked to silviculture. So, silviculture or the cultivation of trees or the cultivation of a wood is a field that requires the knowledge of silvics, which is the study of the life history of the plant growth. It is also something that requires a knowledge and application of, of all of these different fields of forestry. So, this is the basics of silviculture and we will build on these topics in the next lecture. Thank you.